Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Bouchard, and I am the MetaMask Developer Relations Manager. And today we have a great workshop for you. It's the MetaMask SDK plus Linea workshop. Today we're going to be starting with a Vite uh, application and generating a React and TypeScript um, DAP. And that is the bulk of the workshop. We're going to build a full stack React DAP using the SDK, Infura, Truffle, and we're gonna to deploy to Linea. Now you can um, use the code that we have in this workshop. Um, you can use the same tools we have. You can also use um, things like hard hat or whatever. It's just a quick um, configuration file change. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into this and, and get started. So again, my name is Eric Bouchard. Um, this is my title here, Developer Relations Manager at MetaMask. And you can find me on Twitter, Telegram, GitHub, Lens, .eth, all of the above, probably even some more places um, like Reddit, etc. cetera, as uh, HTTP Junkie. That's at HTTP J-U-N-K-I-E. Um, my DMs are always open. As developer relations, we are your front door to the product and engineering teams, pretty much at any company or any product, but uh, especially here at MetaMask and Consensus. So whether it's a question about MetaMask, one of our specific MetaMask features or products, or maybe it's something else in the Consensus lineup of tools. Um, it could be Linea, it could be Infura, whatever. Just come, ask us, our DMs are always open, and that's what we're here to do answer your questions, or if we can't answer those questions, to find the right people to do that. So what we'll be doing in the workshop is cloning down an existing GitHub repo. Um, this repo uses the MetaMask SDK. That's mostly what we're going to be focusing on here is um, kind of uh, getting this dApp working. It's mostly going to be configuration. We don't have enough time to build the application from scratch. Uh, nor is that really kind of the scope of this workshop. Um, but what the SDK does is it allows you, your users to connect to the MetaMask browser extension or MetaMask mobile. Um, so it gives the user that option, which is really cool. Um, previously, if you were connecting, you know, a dApp to your MetaMask wallet, you typically only have the ability to connect them to the browser extension. You could use other tools uh, out there like a wallet connect or something like that to connect to MetaMask mobile. But um, pretty much all you have to do now is instantiate the MetaMask SDK inside of your project. And then when you call ETH underscore request accounts, which you kind of have to do in order to connect to MetaMask, um, it gives that user that option. And we'll see what that looks like here in just a few moments. Um, first, we're gonna go through all the slides. Um, and here, if you wanna take a screenshot um, these are all the links that you can get to our GitHub repo. That's the first link at the top. Um, the slides, which you're looking at right now, is the second link. Finally, we'll get to a point where we're going to explain Linea a little bit. It's a L2 ZK rollup um, created by Consensus. And I'll do as good as a job as I can at explaining what Linea is. But um, we do have a really good Linea explainer little workshop as well. You can find lots of them on YouTube from our DevRel Emily Lynn. So yeah, screenshot this and take a look at these uh, various URLs if you want to grab the resources for this workshop. All right, so the agenda. So we have a demo app that we're gonna be cloning down um, and basically configuring. We have a review of Linea, which will just take a few moments. Um, again, if you want to go a little bit deeper into Linea, you can check out Emily Lenz um, Explainer, which we have linked to on the previous slide right here. Second link. Um, as well, we're going to review the SDK basics. Um, in our project, we're going to clone um, the workshop project, we're going to install all the dependencies. We're going to configure all the env environment variables. We're going to review the blockchain and web workspaces. So those are different folders within our workspace. We're going to then build and deploy uh, to Linea Testnet. Uh, we will test the front end application. So from minting and testing the contract and wallet interaction um, is our state from our wallet in sync with our application, etc. 
the demo. Um, the demo will look a little bit like this. Um, when we're using the SDK, there's a few things to remember. Um, if your users have already connected with the browser in MetaMask before, when they come to your site, they will probably see a screen that looks a lot like this. So you can't see the connect button in the top right here, but um, when connecting, um, if they've already connected to the MetaMask browser extension, it'll probably give them that option again. Um, you can employ a cache buster or something like that in order to ensure that that doesn't happen, but it, um, we do kind of track what was the, the way that they connected last time. And if it's through the browser extension, we'll go ahead and try to do that the next time they connect just to make it easier for your user. Um, but what the SDK also does is if they're visiting your site for the first time, is it'll give them the opportunity to choose desktop or mobile. If they choose desktop, they will have a link in which they can connect uh, to MetaMask using ETH underscore request accounts, um, just like you normally would connecting to the browser extension. If they choose mobile, well, that's when they get this QR code, which they can you know, pull out their phone, they can scan the QR code, and um, yeah, they will be able to connect with MetaMask mobile. So once they're connected, whether they're through the extension or mobile, you will see the chain that they're connected to. So if they're connected to Linea, it'll show that. Um, if they're not connected to Linea, then what will happen is they will get a switch network button, which will programmatically um, switch them over to the correct chain. It'll add and or switch them over to the correct Linea chain. Um, to the right of that, it will show their... Um, their address for their mobile wallet. It'll display the amount of ETH or whatever they're, you know, you're connected to. Um, in, in our case, it's ETH. That'll be the Linea ETH that they have. Um, if you also see to the left of Linea there, it says extension. It's a little, not really a button, but a tag that says extension. So when we connect them to the the wallet, if they choose extension, then it'll show that extension there. If we connect to mobile, it'll show mobile. And all that is, is just a little bit of a conditional rendering in our React application to just let you know that, hey, it's possible to tell whether they're connected to the extension or mobile. That might be something that you want to know as a application developer, or you might want to conditionally render one thing versus the other, depending on how they're connected. Um, overall, when they're connected to one or the other, the experience is pretty much the same. It's just where they approve their transactions or where they sign. Is it in the extension pop-up in the browser or is it on the mobile phone, right? Um, but otherwise, it's it's pretty much seamless. Below this, we have um, our ticket types. This is a fictitious, a fictitious event called ETH Atlantis, um, the best ETH uh, conference under the sea. Again, it's not real. This is just a demo application. But what we do is we give them the... Uh, the ability to mint a general admission or a VIP ticket. Um, the way that our contract determines in this, you know, very contrived demo is if they submit 0.01 ETH, well, they're going to get general admission. If they submit 0.02 ETH, we'll, they'll get a VIP. Um, and no other option is available. So it works out for us. Um, it's kind of a hacky way of doing things, but again, this is a demo. It's contrived. Um, but yeah, once they mint that ticket, um, we will disable their button while the minting process is happening. And then once the ticket has been minted, once the transaction is complete, what we're going to be doing is calling into the contract to find out, hey, what tokens or NFTs has this person already minted with this contract? And you can see here that this user, uh, which was me, um, had minted a general admission and a VIP ticket. And you can tell that they are unique. Um, not only do they have a ticket number, right? So even if someone, there's not uh, a 1000 and 1001 for GA, no, if you uh, mint a GA and a VIP, they will both have unique numbers for that event. It will also tell whether it is a general admission or a VIP. It'll have their um, wallet address printed onto the ticket. Plus they have a different background as well. So no one ticket can ever be the same. Again, very contrived, um, but just a way of showing you how to create completely unique NFTs that are stored on the blockchain 
uh, with the contract that we have. And you don't have to use a contract that stores an, an SVG on chain. You could do, you could use IPFS or something else for the purpose of this workshop. We're trying not to deal with all of that overhead of showing you how to use IPFS um, and to store images somewhere else. There's a lot of overhead involved with that. So we went with an on-chain SVG ticket for the purpose of the workshop. Um, as I said, you can see up here, we have, um, it shows where the, how you're connected, uh, what chain you're connected to, the address, and the uh, amount of ETH that you have in your balance. Um, here is where the tickets are, and then the NFTs down here that we just talked about. Cool. So what is Linea? So I'll do my best to describe Linea. But as a developer, I'll tell you that if I can deploy to Ethereum or maybe even something like uh, Polygon, um, it's not really that different for me. Not a lot changes. Um, so Linea is an L2 scaling solution. It is a type 2 ZK rollup. Uh, we use Linea for deploying our contracts. Um, and from watching uh, Emily's course, you can kind of determine what is Linea, described probably way better than I can. What is an L2? Uh, what is a type 2 ZK rollup, anatomy of a rollup? Uh, you can understand the asset transfer process and understand kind of the difference between optimistic and ZK rollups. So I'll go over a little bit of what, what this stuff is. So a type 2 ZK rollup uh, is not a layer 1. So a layer 2 is a separate blockchain that increases the transaction speed and throughput while partially deriving its security from uh, Ethereum EVM. It pulls off that execution layer uh, away from L1. They rely on Ethereum for data, avail uh, data availability and then post their transaction data back onto L1. Um, rollups are the most widely accepted implementation. Um, you have optimistic rollups like Arbitrum, uh, Optimism, uh, even Base. Um, then you have ZK rollups like Linea, ZK Sync, Polygon, ZK EVM, Scroll, and StarkNet. So what is a ZK EVM, right? It's a zero knowledge Ethereum virtual machine. So it executes smart contract transactions in a way that uh, uses existing Ethereum infrastructure. Uh, in a way that ZK proofs can understand. So the way a proofer works is by submitting the programs that uh, translate into math, which pulls out a Boolean like a true or false. That's done through arithmetization, which is a difficult process. And because this is difficult, there are four major types of ZK EVMs, right? You have a type four, type three, type two, and type one. So we'll go over two of those um, because I think at, at the highest level, you have the high level language equivalent. Uh, you can think of a type four as like a StarkNet, ZK Sync. Um, and those are not 100% like the EVM, right? So your tooling changes, some op codes are not covered. Uh, if you're using hard hat, it may require its own plugin, right? You have type three, which is a partially EVM equivalent. And then you have type two, which is fully EVM equivalent, which is what Linea is. So it's language equivalent, which means that I can write in Solidity and uh, it's bytecode equivalent. Um, you c you're fully compatible with your existing application that you've already built maybe on Ethereum, right? Um, Ethereum, Polygon, whatever. Um, as a dev, really nothing changes. No tooling changes. All opcodes are recognized. Right. And then you have type one, which is a uh, fully Ethereum equivalent. Again, um, Linea is a type two. So if you want to learn more about any, or sorry, Linea, I would suggest going over to Emily's uh, little crash course, Linea Explainer. The link is up here at the top right of the screen up there, way up there. Um, and then you might also want to look into the different types of ZK EVMs and specifically focus on the type two uh, ZK EVMs, which is what Linea is. Also, um, Linea.build, you can find all the docs for Linea. And if you have any questions, again, the developer relations team, myself, Emily, any other developer relations person that you might find at Consensus or MetaMask, they are your front door. Um, they are the ones that can answer your questions or find the right people that can do that. All right, so the MetaMask uh, SDK and ADAPT. So what I'm showing you here is actually the way that the SDK used to work. So if you are below 0.5.0, .0, this is how it worked. Your connect button would determine whether or not you have a MetaMask extension. 
And then if so, it would connect you to that extension. Um, otherwise, the um, SDK would realize that you did not have an extension, so a MetaMask extension in your browser, and it would pop up a QR code. Uh, QR code. If you didn't have either of those, it would also give you the option to download MetaMask and install it. The way that the SDK works after 0.5.0 .0 is that there is there still is this kind of yes, no, uh, is there a MetaMask extension installed, but only if someone is already previously connected to the browser extension. Um, so it's a little bit different. There's a little bit more logic going on. But what happens now is that the user is pretty much given that choice at the beginning. They get a little modal a pop-up. Um, it's responsive. It works very well. There's nothing... Uh, it, it, it actually makes a better user experience for connecting to MetaMask, in my opinion. Um, but they, they're giving that, that option. So let's say that I have an extension in my browser, but I'm using Chrome, and um, I maybe only have my test wallet set up in Chrome. It's not my personal wallet. It's not the one connected with my ENS domain or something like that, right? But it's just this weird test wallet that I have set up. Maybe it's a Rabi wallet or something like that. Something that says it's MetaMask, but it's not MetaMask, right? And I know I don't want to connect to that thing. I want to use my mobile phone. Well, I have that option um, kind of at the beginning um, and, and I can connect with that. Um, so I think it's a better user experience. And again, being able to connect a DAP to a mobile and be able to being able to work with the window.ethereum object in the same exact way is I think super valuable for DAP developers. And that's kind of what the MetaMask SDK brings you. And in the future, we'll have other helper functions. We have uh, libraries coming out for React developers and who knows what after then. But um, some of the React components that we have coming out are, are for state management. We have connect buttons and other things like that, which you can just drop into your application and they work along with the MetaMask SDK. Um, a few other things I would note also note is that um, MetaMask is working with um, packages like Wagme and Web3 React and um, Block Natives on Web3 on Border. Uh, we're trying to put in a pull request with them so that we can have the SDK right there uh, in the in the tools that you like to use in order to connect to multiple wallets. Here are some references. So we have a MetaMask SDK developer resource guide. We have the Linea L2 ZK rollup um, information here. And also another repo down here, which is the MIP GitHub repo. This is the MetaMask improvement proposals. Um, kind of unrelated to this workshop, but I thought I would put it in here because um, a lot of people that will be work watching this workshop either um, have a good idea of how to work with MetaMask or have worked with it in the past and are here to learn a little bit about the SDK, but they might be interested in being part of the MetaMask improvement proposal. Um, uh, it, it is a program that we have going on and we meet, I think it's once a month uh, and discuss MetaMask improvement proposals, but also you can um, work with us async through our GitHub account. And uh, you can either submit MetaMask improvement proposals or create issues to that re GitHub repo. So let's go. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our um, workshop. So I'm going to go ahead and close down our, uh, our Google Docs there and if you were to go to that first link that I had you screenshot, it would take you to this GitHub repo. All right. Um, and here you will find a readme that will walk you through one, all the information about the workshop, kind of what it uses. Some of this may change over time. Um, so just keep up to date with, um, you know, always check out this top page here, this top part of the page here to figure out kind of what we're using. You know, maybe we decide to go hard hat in the future. Maybe we continue using Truffle. Um, we adapt these workshops based off of feedback from the developer community. So although it uses a lot of consensus tools, if we get a lot of feedback saying, hey, you know, I really want to see how to do this in hard hat, we might end up doing that. Um, and then you have steps, you know, clone the project down, open your editor, um, create an inferior account. So we're going to go through all of these really quickly, get everything up and running, and you will see how this, uh, how this all works. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to clone down this workshop and I'm going to copy this last little part right here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open my terminal. I think it's this one. 
And let's just go ahead and add that last little bit on the end there. So what we're going to do is we're going to, let's make sure we spell this correctly. Not GTI clone, let's do a git clone. That'll probably be better. So what this is going to do is this is going to clone down our repo into a folder called um, react-sdk-linea-workshop. And then we're going to CD into that directory. And then from there, we will do all of our, um, we will get all of our uh, dependencies installed. All right, so uh, it cloned it down and it also changed us into that directory. And from here, I'm just going to open Visual Studio Code. Um, here we go. Let's close this other one. All right, and we can also get rid of this other terminal back here and just open this up. And we'll, we can see what we have inside of here. Let's also get a, a terminal open here. And if we go to the readme, just go ahead and open up the readme. It's the same uh, readme that we saw over on GitHub. And what we want to do is we already cloned the workshop. So step two is just to run npm install. So we can do that down here. And what this is going to do is because we're using Turbo Repo, um, which you can find about all up here, I'm going to kind of skip over that for sake of time. Um, Turbo Repo kind of has these, uh, what I would just call like different workspaces, blockchain and web. Each of these has its own package.json. It has its own environment variables file, but it's going to go into both of those and it's going to install the dependencies in those packages.json. All right, so it's done installing. Um, great. Step three. So we want to create uh, an Infura account, and uh, that's one thing that I haven't done yet. I mean, I actually have an Infura account, but I'm going to walk you through. So let's go ahead and open up Infura.io. I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And I'm going to pause this for a minute while I sign in. And once you get signed in, you will have, you'll be basically brought to this dashboard where you can create a new API key. And that's what we want to do. So we want to create a new API key. So we want to go ahead and create a new uh, Web3 Web API key and uh, not IPFS. We're going to do this one here. And we're going to call it um, ETH Atlantis. We're going to hit create. And you can call it whatever you want. Uh, that's going to give us an API key here, which we want to copy. Um, and we will. I will also kind of point out Linea mainnet and testnet. We're going to be using the testnet here. But if you switch over to mainnet, you can get the... Uh, this will, is what you're going to plug into your Truffle or your Hardhat config. But if you wanted to uh, deploy to something else, you know, Polygon, Optimism, or, you know, Palm, Ethereum, you can find all of the links for those here inside of Infura. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and come over to our application here, and we will see that we need to rename the file in our web directory, which is env.example, and let's just get rid of the .example at the end. All right, and we're going to paste this right here. Um, also, we're going to be using Linea, so we're just going to put in the hex code for that here. Um, there are some pretty cool tools out there if you want to be able to find out what the hex code or the chain ID for a particular um, network is. So one is chainlist.org. And if we see here, we can do include test nets and we can click on, um, we can just search for Linea. There's uh, the Linea, so we see the, the, the code, the hex code. We also see the actual chain ID, um, and that's pretty cool. We also have um, eSerialize, which if I were to put in, let's grab this 59144, um, the way we would do this is we want to put in a number and we want to get the hex value of it. We see OXE 708. 
just the same as we see here. Um, so two really cool um, tools I think you should know about as an Ethereum developer or a blockchain developer. Um, cool, so we have our environment variable here uh, filled out, environment variable file filled out. Um, let's go back to our readme. And the next one we want to do is we want to copy that same Infura project ID over to our blockchain. Um, and we want to rename this as well. So let's go ahead and get rid of dot example here. And um, I think I don't, I don't still have that one. So let's go ahead and grab it again from here. Copy that here and then i'm going to pause while i get my private key but i'll show you how to do that so we want to open up um metamask and uh for i'm going to go to account that's not one that i could say an imported account um so what you would do is you're going to click on yeah yeah this guy here um account details and then you're gonna hit show private key all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that in the background. Again, that's right here. Um, you, you, you select the accounts, uh, you click on the three little dots next to the account, account details, show private key. So while I do that real quick, uh, if you're following along, you can do it as well. And then we're gonna paste that into the file. I'm gonna be sure not to show you guys that because you never want to share your private key. So one moment. All right, so now that out of the way, I, um, I added that private key to my blockchain environment variable file and I want to click off of that real quick just to make sure I don't accidentally click on it and we want to go back to our readme and just continue following along so um, now that we have our environment variables filled out um, one area of the project uh, you should be aware of is your truffle config or you might have your hard hat config over here and um, let's kind of walk through it real quick just to see what we have set up so a few things that I would point out is that we have these contract build directories and contract directory. We're telling it where our contract is located. It's in this contracts ETH tickets. So here is our contract. Um, if I go back to that. Um, also, where do we want to build out the ABIs to? So we want to go into the web directory and into a folder called lib. That's where I'm putting mine. And that gives our front end application access to that contract ABI. So that's the first thing I would kind of go over here. Um, how that works within the application, you can poke around the application a little bit and see how it uses that ABI. Um, it's, we're using it um, with, along with type chain, um, but those are all things that um, are kind of beyond the scope of the course. We're just gonna show you how to get everything um, kind of up and running. So I have a few different networks set here. I have Garely, I have Mumbai, and I have Linea. So I just wanted to put a few different ones in here so that you, um, and also I got these from Infura. So basically I copied the Infura um, link that I was showing you inside of uh, when we created our API key. And then I'm just replacing the last part with whatever project, uh, Infura project ID that I have inside my environment variable file here. So whatever, it uh, goes at the end here is the same as what I've put right here in my environment variable file. Let's go back to that. Um, so we have scripts in our application to deploy to Garely, Mumbai, or Linea. We will be using the one for Linea, and that's what we'll be kind of going over next. So let's go back to the readme. Um, we can also check out the trouble configuration uh, docs if you need to, or um, if you're using Hardhat, it should really be no different. Um, there's a few little minor differences, but, um, you know, Truffle and Hardhat are kind of similar. Um, we're using Truffle in this workshop in the future. Maybe we'll do one using Hardhat so that we can show people what the slight little differences are there. Um, yeah, so here's all the different um, files that may or may not use your uh, public network ID. But step four. We need to get some Linea ETH. So if you don't have any Linea ETH, you can do one of two things. You can go to infura.io slash faucet slash Linea, and you from there will be able to get some Linea ETH for testing purposes. Um, if you're part of my workshop, 
you can reach out to me. I can give you some. Maybe um, it takes, I think you get 0.5 a day through the faucet. Um, if you need it really quickly, uh, if you need a little bit more than that 0.5, reach out to me. I can probably hook you up. Um, I have quite a bit of it. So anyways, step, uh, I already have some in my wallet, so I'm going to skip this step. But just know that you can go to this link here. You can paste in your wallet uh, address and you can get uh, some of that Lenny ETH dripped down to you. So step five will be to build uh, the project and compile the contracts. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. We're going to run npm run build. Let's run, let's run truffle compile real quick. Truffle compile. Uh, got an error here. Let's try and determine what this is. Let's CD into our uh, apps real quick. Blockchain. Uh, I just ran Truffle Compile kind of inside of the, let's run NPM, run build now. Let's see if this changes anything. All right, so we're getting an issue here. This actually looks like an issue in our own code. So I'm going to try to determine what this is real quick and come right back and uh, give you the solution. All right. So um, what I will go ahead and do is update our GitHub repository and remove this auto connect. Um, I believe that with the new version of the SDK that that is set to true automatically and you don't have to do anything there. So hopefully removing that right now. Um, we'll get rid of our issue. It was on line 117. So if that's in your workshop, you can remove it. I will try to do uh, my best to remove that and kind of make that change to the GitHub repo. So hopefully that won't be an, an issue. But if anyone runs into that, um, cool. You'll know how to resolve it. Let's go back here and run npm run build and see if we have any issues again. And it looks like that cleared up our our error. And that was just a TypeScript error. It wasn't anything um, wrong with actual linea or deploying, running and building. It was uh, so npm run build will not only build your contracts, but it'll also build your front end web application. And in that case, we were getting a TypeScript error. If you get an error there, pay very close attention to what line it's on, what file it's on. Go check your file. If there's a little red squiggly line or some obvious thing there, that's where your issue is. Um, so if you cha start changing uh, our workshop out quite a bit, uh, just be aware of that if you're using the same commands that we're running. Now, um, we could deploy to Linea or Mumbai or Ethereum or Gerli, any of them really, because uh, it's pretty much all the same as far as deploying from a developer perspective and working with our contracts. But we're going to choose to run npm run deploy linea. And what this is doing is it's calling a script up here in our package.json. Um, so we will see right here, deploy Mumbai, deploy linea, deploy Gurley. Let's say that you wanted to set up like a deploy to Arbitrum or something. You would need to add a new script right here, deploy Arbitrum, and then you would want to do dash dash network Arbitrum. Uh, and that would get you squared away. But we are going to go ahead and go back to the readme, we're going to copy this npm run deploy to linea. We'll go ahead and paste that in here. And what we should be getting is a contract address. And um, there's ways that you can write that contract address directly to the file that you need. In my case, it is a, um, in my web directory, I have this lib config. Um, so Maybe you can put a piece of code in here that, you know, checks that contract ABI and finds out what the contract address is and uses it. But I'm just going to do a quick little copy paste. 
So I'm going to copy our contract address it just gave us. I'm going to put it under the Linea one. Make sure you put it under Linea because that's where it's our application is going to be looking since we're running against Linea right now. Um, and with that, we should be good to go to the next step. So the next step is, yeah, we already did this. We already copied the contract address into that. So we've completed step seven as well. And the next is just pretty much to run the application and let's start testing it out. Um, so go down here, run npm run dev testnet. Um, and if we wanna search for where that command is really quickly, um, JSON, it's right here in our main directory. So our root directory, which is dev underscore testnet, which is basically just gonna run npm run dev. Um, and it's going to be, you know, telling you about the work, the, the web workspace here, which is the web directory. So this is going to run our front end application using turbo repo. And you should see this uh, little link pop up. And if we click on that, we will see our application um, really quickly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to inspect, I'm going to go to application. I'm going to make sure that we don't have. I'm just going to delete anything that's already in here. Make sure there's nothing in session storage. So lo local storage, session storage, there's nothing in here. We have a basically um, nothing cached as far as what the user's uh, preferences are for connecting to MetaMask. Um, at this point, I want to hit the connect MetaMask button. And here's where you see the SDK, right? All I, all I did when connecting that MetaMask button, that connect MetaMask button, if we want to go look at it real quickly, um, we go into the navigation, so let's go into components, navigation, navigation.tsx, and we will find that connect button. Here it is here. It's calling connect MetaMask. Um, connect MetaMask is found inside of our use MetaMask folder, or sorry, file. And um, inside of here, there's going to be a connect MetaMask function which we'll find real quick. Oh. Here it is. So all that we're doing is we're calling eth underscore request accounts, but because we've instantiated our SDK, right here, right, then it's going to automatically, I mean, it's that simple. It's going to automatically pull up this little uh, modal, which give our users a nice little, hey, I can connect through desktop or I can connect through mobile. So we'll go ahead and connect with the MetaMask extension first, or maybe we should do mobile. Let's do the desktop first, then we'll come back and do mobile. So go ahead and connect, and we can see here that my account, um, with the you know OX seven E five is the one that's actually connected here. I'm on the Linea chain now. What would have happened if I would have been on a different chain, like you know um, Linea mainnet? But I wanted them to be on Linea testnet, right? So what my application would have done, and what you, and you can see how to do this is it would have uh, conditionally rendered this switch chain button, which when I click on it will programmatically um, either if the testnet. If the Linea test not chain is not in MetaMask already, it will add it. Uh, otherwise, it will just connect me over to it. So I'll click that and boom, switches me back over to the correct network. And now I'm good to go. Um, another thing that you could also do is if they're if, if the same logic you would use to render that switch button, you could also use to disable your minting buttons, right? You may not want them to mint an NFT unless they are on the right network. Um, cool. So we see everything here. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're just going to, you know, test out our application, make sure our minting buttons work. So we'll go ahead and hit mint ticket here. And obviously, since I'm connected to the browser extension, it's going to confirm all of that over here in the MetaMask extension. And notice that my button is again, disabled while I'm, while the minting transaction, uh, is not complete yet. So as soon as that transaction is finished, we will see that that will go away and then wow, we get our NFT showing up there at the bottom that we just minted. And so let's take a look at that really quickly in our uh, application. So I think to start off here, the thing that we should take a look at really quickly is our 
contract. Now, again, this is a contrived contract. It is um, specifically for demo purposes. You probably want to build something a little bit better for yours. But um, the thing that makes this work where I can go and fetch these NFTs that are on chain and display them right here in the browser is a few things. So one, it is this wallet of owner function inside of my contract, which basically if I, if I mint five different NFT tickets, you know, one for me and four of my friends, I get a VIP for me and a general admission for all of my friends, of course. Well, then, um, I minted them all with a certain address, right? And I don't have any way to transfer those over. Basically you, you mint it, it's yours. Um, so I can call into this wallet of owner and I can get back a list of the token IDs that were that basically I've minted on this contract. With those token IDs, I can then call into, let's see here, generate NFT SVG by token ID. So by passing that token ID into this function here, which is a public function on our contract, um, we might like if, if I've generated five of them, then my react application would actually run through all five of those token IDs and call this five times in a row and it'll get the generated SVG and it'll display that onto the page. So that's how that's being done. Um, we could take a little bit more look at this con this contract. So this is the top portion of my SVG and this is the bottom portion. Um, I just split them up for, um, organizational purposes. We also have the token URI being created for the actual NFT. And then we have um, the collection uh, contract URI for the collection of uh, NFTs for this, uh, this, this project. Um, we have a can mint function. So we want to make sure that the total supply has not reached the max supply, that the, uh, the, the minting kind of deadline has not occurred yet. I think for what we're doing here, it's one week long. So once I deploy the contract, I can mint for up to one week. After that, anyone will get an error if they're trying to mint um, from this contract. Uh, you could set that as long as you want. Um, there is a mint deadline variable above in the file that you can set that to a different time frame if you want to. And then here, um, we're either we're making sure that the message dot value, otherwise the price being sent over is either 0 0.01 or 0 0.02, which would give them either a GA or a VIP ticket price. If it's any other value, it's not going to work. Um, so that's the contract in a nutshell. Um, yeah, here is the, the price for the VIP ticket, GA ticket, the max supply. Um, we start with zero uh, when the contract is deployed and every time we mint, uh, an NFT that goes up one. Um, yeah. And we have a few open Zeppelin contracts that we've used in this. Um, then if we go and take a look at our tickets page, uh, tickets owned to be specific, we will see how we're calling into that contract. So, um, the first thing I would kind of take a look at here is list of tickets. So this will be what we actually kind of loop over um, this code right here in order to generate each of those images that we've gotten. Um, but let's take a little bit further look into here's where we call that wallet of owner, right? So we call wallet of owner, we tell it what our wallet address is, and then we're going to get, um, a list of owned tickets back. We can then map over those owned tickets and then we can call, um, that token URI, And then we can get our um, we can get our actual ticket back. Sorry. So um, one thing is that the token URI calls the other one. So I think I, I I said that wrong over here. So token URI calls in to generate an SV, a, a, a NFT SVG by token ID. Okay. Uh, that was one thing that I kind of messed up in saying over there. This is the one that we actually call. It's public as well. Um, you could call either one, but that's the one we're calling from our tickets owned. And then that's getting our SVG back. And then we are literally just pushing these, uh, into a, uh, an array. And then we are looping over them up here and then displaying them here on our page. And that is how we get 
our ticket showing up here at the bottom. So if I were to mint another ticket here, a VIP ticket, once that NFT mint is complete, we are setting a global variable just to one number higher. Um, and when that number, that global variable changes, that number changes, in other words, the user has minted another ticket, this portion of code down here knows to run again and to go check if any new SVG NFT tickets has been um, created on this contract by this user, and then it displays them out. So every time I mint a ticket, um, let's say that I have 100 of them here, it will actually have to call back in and generate all 100 again. Again, this is a demo application. It's contrived. It's for demo purposes only, but it works, and it gives you an idea of how to work with these various things. Um, making that a little bit more efficient would be up to you uh, in building a more production app. So um, let's go back to our readme real quick. Let's make sure that we're not forgetting anything that I want to go over here. So we've connected. Oh, well, let's go ahead and just test out one thing really quickly here. So um, we notice that we're connected to Linea and we already changed the chain and, and it gave us the um, the button to switch us back to the right change. But what happens if we change like the account? So notice if I connect to a different account, all of my tickets disappear, but it has updated my, my, uh, balance and my address here. And I'm, um, so let's go, let's refresh this for a moment here. Um, let's go back over to our other account. All right, um, we do have a little bit of an issue with our mobile and extension. Um, we have just released a new SDK package. I may be getting that tag incorrectly. It's not a big deal. Again, everything works the same for both, but I'll, I might need to update that code uh, in the repo to make sure that it's always uh, showing the correct one there. But other than that, everything seems to be working fine. Our wallet state, uh, most importantly, is staying in sync with our application state. And the way that that is happening right now is because we are using this use MetaMask, um, basically context provider. So if you're familiar with React, you'll understand what a context provider is. We've created a context here and we have some, uh, quite a bit of code going on to understand, um, you know, how many minting, how many mints have we had, um, all sorts of things. Is there any, have, have there been any errors? Let's go ahead and generate an error. Um, so let's go ahead and try to mint a ticket and we are going to reject it. And you'll see down here that we have uh, action rejected. If we click on this, the error will go away. Um, so that's another piece of our global state is that when we get an error from MetaMask, whether we get an error, whether we get, uh, they, they change their account, whether the balance changes, whether the chain changes, we take all of that information through, um, either a rejected request or error or through um, events that are happening with MetaMask. So if I change the account, if I change the chain ID or the balance changes, that actually triggers an event that we have covered down here. We have all these events that we're watching. Um, and if any of these happens, we are then calling into a certain function that will update our global state, right? So this is a little bit more involved. Um, the good thing is, is that we've shown you how to kind of keep your state, your wallet state in sync with your React application here in this file. Um, this is put together rather quickly for a workshop. Again, demo purposes. Um, however, we have a React package coming out, which will have uh, basically a use SDK hook and also some connect buttons in it that you can just drop into your application and not have to worry about writing any of this stuff. So look out for that. As soon as um, we have that available and we've announced it, which should be very soon, then I'll be uh, tweeting about it and I'll also be updating the workshop to use those instead. We'll probably have both of them in here so that you could see how we've done this uh, anyways, but it won't be being used. We'll be using the use SDK hook um, from the SDK um, it's basically a companion library that's coming along with the SDK, a React companion library. All right, so um, 
We've tested that. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to test here. Um, if we change the chain, we'll, we'll, do we see it reflected in the UI? Do we get a switch chain button? Yes, we do. Can we change accounts and see it reflected in the UI? Yes, we can. Can we mint a ticket? Yes. Um, see the NFT ticket show up at the bottom of the page? Yes. Disconnect from both accounts and make sure that it is reflected in the UI. Disable the MetaMask browser extension. So that's kind of our next thing that we want to do here. So we want to come up here and uh, we're connected to two different accounts. So let's go ahead and we're going to do that here. We're going to disconnect this account and then we're going to disconnect this account. All right. And again, I am going to, since I've already connected with MetaMask, I'm also going to, just for the sake of the demo, I'm going to make sure that there is nothing stored in here. So I'm going to delete all of these. You could also use, um, you could also do this programmatically, but I'm just going to make sure that there's nothing else there. Um, and once I disconnected from those, notice notice that all of that min, those menu items went away. I didn't have to refresh the page or anything. That's all React state. Um, knowing that like, hey, they've disconnected from MetaMask and uh, conditionally rendering this connect MetaMask button. Um, now what we can do is we can connect, we can hit that connect MetaMask button and let's try to log in with our mobile phone. So we'll click mobile here and let me just pull up my mobile application in my phone real quick. This may take a moment. My phone was not on. All right, got MetaMask opening up and what I'm going to be doing, uh, if you can see here up in the top right-hand corner, there is a little QR code. I'm going to hit that. And I'm going to scan the QR code here. And you'll see that we want to accept this. And boom, we are logged in. Now I was on Ethereum mainnet here, so I am not on the correct chain, so it's going to switch me over. I'm going to click the switch chain button. Cool. Yeah. And then I'm going to switch over to Linea Gearly Test Network. I'm going, to, I'm going to approve that. Uh oh, I shouldn't hit. It gave, I, I messed up here, um, 929. So if I disconnect on that, on a, uh, this is actually good because we can show that the disconnect works here. Um, we're gonna refresh the page and hit connect to MetaMask again. That was my fault. I hit the wrong button. I dismissed it and then tried to change it manually. But it actually did what it was supposed to do. Um, if, you, if it figures out that you've disconnected from MetaMask Mobile at any point in time you'll see on the screen there that it actually showed me a number that i have to click on my phone that is the same number and that will just make sure that i'm disconnected completely from uh metamask um or i can connect back up again anyway so i'm i'm connected back up again this time and i'm on the right uh test net so we're good there um and you can see here that i'm connected with a different wallet address um, and if I were to, uh, you know, same thing happens. If I were to switch the account, uh, let's try that real quick. I'm going to go to account two. Okay. So now I'm on account two. Um, here is the situation. So since I'm on mobile, um, it's a little bit different when you just, switch accounts from one to the other on mobile, right? You need to make sure that um, you're connected with account one. You need to be on account one. But um, at this point, if I can go ahead and mint a ticket, let's just go ahead and make sure that we know that on MetaMask mobile, it will ask us, you know, for confirmation. So I want to scroll down a little bit here and I want to hit confirm. And now our minting process is happening. So transaction is submitted. And in a moment, it takes a tiny bit longer with mobile to recognize that transaction. Still, our, our minting button is still, um, you know, disabled because that transaction is not completed yet. And it says transaction complete. One, two, three, four, 
five. There we go. <laughs> Again, takes a tiny bit longer with MetaMask Mobile. There's some polling. There's some uh, communication going on behind the scenes that is just a little bit more uh, time consuming than uh, with your MetaMask extension. And I figured out what's going on here with my little tag is that I have the Boolean in my, in my React application, the switch. So when I'm connected to mobile, it's telling me I'm on extension. When I'm connected to uh, extension, it's telling me on mobile. That would be a really quick fix. It was probably a programming error of my part, but I can see that this is actually working kind of as intended. It's just showing the wrong one. So when I'm connected to mobile, extension, extension, mobile, that's just changing the logic around of how this uh, thing is conditionally rendered. But I don't want to take too much longer because um, we're reaching kind of the end of the workshop. But everything so far is working exactly uh, as I expected it to. Um, I, I ran into the one little issue where um, I kind of re I accidentally kind of rejected the request to um, what was it? Change the chain chain, the, the, the change chain. Um, and then it tried to disconnect me. It realized that I was disconnected and then it gave me that number, um, to make sure that I, uh, that I was clicking on the right number that was being displayed on my phone. That's a security, uh, feature of connecting to MetaMask mobile. Um, and, and then it disconnected me and then I just, um, use the QR code to scan and log in again. Um, a lot of these things can be programmed on your side to make it very, very seamless. And it's not too hard to do these things. Um, so the best thing to do is, and that's why I did include this little uh, information here about what, whether you're connected to extension or mobile, uh, even though I did it incorrectly, um, is so that if you find that you want to do something a tiny bit different when you're connected to mobile, you can do that. There are some edge cases where um, the logic might be different when you're connected to mobile because of the way that um, the mobile application works with the app. But at the surface, it's pretty much all the same. The same events work that you're you're listening to from MetaMask. You still use the window.ethereum um, uh, object in order to interact with the MetaMask mobile, even though it's slightly being faked. Um, and, you know... If you make changes, if your balance changes and all that kind of stuff, it's all just going to automatically reflect in your application. Your, your app state is going to stay in sync with your wallet. And, um, but yeah, um, we're going to continue building out this workshop, um, and, you know, adding additional features and just making it as fully featured as possible so that everything that you could possibly need to know about working with the SDK is in this workshop. But this is a developer preview, the SDK. It still hasn't reached, you know, a major version one yet. So keep that in mind as you use it. Um, but also know that, like, this is really powerful stuff, especially the fact, like, you can connect to MetaMask Mobile from a dApp and do all the same things that you used to do with your um, MetaMask browser extension. So with that being said, um, I think that's about it. That's the end of the workshop. Um, hopefully you can get this code running down on your computer and everything works. Okay. Uh, I will maybe I'll bring back up the, oh, that's not going to work. Um, so just bringing back up the slideshow really quickly here and, um, I'll go ahead and leave you on this slide. Again, my name is Eric Bouchard. I'm the developer relations manager at MetaMask. You can find me on Twitter, Telegram, GitHub, Lens, .eth, uh, at HTTP Junkie. My DMs are always open. Um, I'm trying to end this video so that it's less than an hour long. But if you have any questions, reach out to me uh, or the rest of my team. And uh, we're always traveling all over the world to various Ethereum conferences and blockchain conferences, multi-chain conferences. You'll see us everywhere. Um, if you see us, please come say hi. And, uh, and ask us any questions or uh, find out how we can work more closely together. We've got an ambassador program. We have an accelerator program. Um, there's lots of ways for you to work with the consensus, MetaMask, Infura, Linea, all these different teams. Thank you very much and have a great day.